Most trading card games last only two years. Time and time again, we see them make the same mistakes and crumble for the same reason. Falling victim to the seven deadly sins of trading card games. Life decking is an element often used in trading card game design that connects your life total to the cards in your deck. Unlike other games where damage dealt to a player is subtracted from some sort of life point total, instead an amount of cards are sent straight from the player's deck to their discard pile. On the surface, it seems like an advantageous design decision. No pesky life totals to keep track of, no dials, no counters, no spin downs, no calculators, no whatever these things are. Just the nice hard monitor in the form of the cards in your deck. Deck out, where a player loses if they cannot draw any cards from their deck when required, is already a win condition in a lot of games, so why don't we kill two birds with one stone and tie the two things together? Sounds good, right? Well, a lot of game designers seem to think so, as games that use life decking are a perennial sight. It's just that they have the slight problem of being completely antithetical to everything trading card games stand for. Oh, you bet I'm gonna back that one up. What do I mean? Well, let's ask a professional. I am Mark Rosewater the head designer for Magic the Gathering. Gee, I think he might be qualified to talk about card games, you guys. Mark Rosewater, the longtime head designer of a little game you might have heard of called Magic the Gathering, did a talk at the Game Developers Conference, or GDC, in 2016 where he presented a thesis called 20 Years, 20 Lessons Learned. It's a fantastic watch, and I highly recommend it, link will be in my sources, but for our purposes, we will be focusing on lesson number five. Now, this lesson isn't speaking on life decking directly, but the message is still applicable. Mark here is specifically talking about a set gimmick involving cards that get stronger when there are a lot of cards in the discard pile, or graveyard as it's called in Magic, which couple with a bunch of cards that let you discard cards from your hand in order to make this happen faster. How did that go over with the audience? I want to play my cards. The titular cards found in card games are specifically designed to be played. One does not add a card to a deck without the intention of playing it or with only a low expectation of playing it. But they didn't want to do that. You know, instead of throwing away their entire hand, they'd rather, I don't know, play the cards in their hand. The excitement in trading card games is the sight of cards being active and clashing with moves and counter moves, which is kind of hard to do when all your cards keep getting frittered away into the discard pile. Every time I play a game that uses life decking and I watch one of my most important cards get milled into oblivion, I feel a pang of frustration. Dang, I wanted to play that card. With a life decking game, you are almost guaranteeing that negative player experience in every game that gets played. I mean, yes, even games without life decking have what are called mill decks, decks that are designed to reduce an opponent's deck to zero, and basically amounts to life decking as a win condition, which can also cause the sensation, and are in my own words, the most frustrating kind of deck to play against, but am I saying that mill decks are bad for a game? Absolutely not! A healthy metagame is one with plenty of options, and when a mill deck is placed on a level playing field, where the strategy is just as viable but risky as any other strategy, and it has to compete with decks that can pummel them into the ground if their mill works don't get going fast enough, then it acts as another piece of the meta's all-important variety. Another big problem with life decking is that innovating with it is nearly impossible. Now, I am going to be speculating here, but I have a theory as to how the design came about with how the new Bakugan Battle Planet game handles life decking. In an effort to take the edge off of the effects of life decking, Bakugan uses special horizontal cards called flip cards. These cards can provide beneficial effects when they flip from the top of the deck from damage, such as stopping the remaining damage or letting you draw cards, but which cannot be played from the hand. Except, remember how players want to play their cards? And you've made a card type that you can't play if you draw it. Huh. So, like I said, I am talking completely hypothetically here. I have no idea if this is how it went down or not, but it is just my theory as to how the system we got in Bakugan might have come about as a result of a push and pull between the game's designers and its playtesters. So I'm guessing that during playtesting of the new game, the designers would ask the testers what they thought of the flip cards, only to get the reply, Oh, we're not using flip cards, they're kinda lame. To which the designers responded, Oh yeah? Well we saw Mark Rosewater's GDC talk too, and the lesson we took is that if players are scared of your game mechanic, that you should FORCE THEM TO USE IT! <laughs> This 
is my theory as to why Bakugan can inflict such high damage. You see this card here, Hydrus Ultra? It does only a piddly one card of damage if it hits, but if it picks up one of these here Fire Fist cores, that damage goes up to four. And considering that a Fire Fist can increase that damage by another six, that's 10 damage in one go on the first turn. 10 cards off the top of a deck size of 40. And considering that the deck is already six cards down from the opening hand, that's nearly half of your deck gone in one turn. And this doesn't even factor in the evolution and effect cards that can pump this damage up even more. Bakugan can truck out hideous damage in a single attack, to the point where when somebody asks me how much damage my attack is going to deal and I answer all of it, they start flipping because they know I'm not lying. When facing such high damage, you'd have to be stupid to not include a clutch of flip cards that can stop damage at low cost in your deck. To which the design team responded, Great! Now that people are using the flip cards, we'll put out a ton of them with unique effects and add all these support cards and- Nobody uses them. You see, in an effort to enforce the addition of flip cards in their decks by requiring damage reducing flip cards, they made it so that those are the only flip cards worth using. Other flip cards just don't really see use. Not even the one that lets you draw the remaining damage into your hand, and not even the one that lets you play any card in your hand for free. The damage dealt is so high and flip cards such a last resort, because players would rather spend resources trying to win the fight, that anything else is a waste of energy. It's the same with stop cards that have additional effects, as either their energy cost is too high, or they have a chance of failure. And remember, the pain starts on turn one. So by doubling down on a mechanic they tied to life decking, Bakugan's designers have designed themselves straight into a hole with a card type that is both mandatory and impossible to really expand upon. On top of that, Bakugan doesn't really have any meaningful way to interact with the oodles of cards dumped into the discard pile aside from a handful that are little more than blunt instruments. So let's take a step back here. Now, I've kind of demonstrated how life decking can both be painful to a game's experience and to its design, but there's also the fact that life decking has been obsolete for over a decade now. You see, there used to be life decking games everywhere, but a lot of them kind of vanished when the world was introduced to this little game called Duel Masters. Get in the Duel Masters took the concept of life decking and shredded it forever with its shield system, introducing a concept that I call damage as resource. In Duel Masters, rather than using a life total or sending cards off the top of the deck, you instead start the game by setting the top five cards of your deck in front of you as shields. When a monster damages you, they break a shield, sending one of those shield cards into your hand. Your hand. You know, where you can play it from? Now, this is an interesting way to do life decking. Admittedly, Pokemon had been doing something similar with their prize card system, but Duel Masters really mastered <laughs> the concept of turning this into a proper life system and to resist something called the snowball effect. The snowball effect refers to a phenomenon where a player who gains an advantage has an easy time with continuing to build on that advantage, like a snowball rolling down a hill, with their opponent only growing more and more helpless and unable to resist. A mechanic such as the shield system means that each time a player takes a hit, they get a little something to maybe turn things around, gaining card advantage at the cost of life points. Other games further built on this system, with Wii Cross, yes, that's how it's pronounced, having a cloth system where damage moves to the energy area to pay for cards, or the game that will not be named, where certain card effects are actually paid for by flipping over the cards in your damage area. This makes for a load of fun gameplay experiences where both dealing and receiving damage become important calculations and you can actually wind up in a better situation than you were before after you take damage in games that use damage as resource. But oh no, this wasn't the only innovation Duel Masters brought to the table. They packed their bags and took this whole thing to Flavortown with the trigger system. This added bit of spice makes it so that when certain trigger cards are revealed as a result of damage, you have the chance to immediately play that card for free. 
Whoa. <laughs> also used by the other games mentioned before, this unpredictable mechanic turns every damage into not just a small resource for the person who just got one step closer to losing, but adds a roll of the dice that can produce a sudden explosion of excitement and just enough uncertainty to give tension to every point of damage delivered. I remember a time where what looked like a certain L suddenly reversed itself when my final shield turned out to be a holy awe that totally shut down my opponent's ability to attack that turn. I later got that card signed by the artist. It is very special to me. Yeah, this is what Bakugan's flip cards were trying to emulate, but uh, here's where you can see the really big design differences, because unlike the card games that use a trigger system, the Bakugan flip cards can't really offer that sort of amazing comeback potential. All they can really do is stop the bleeding. With a life decking system, players are deprived of resources when they take damage, whereas in a damage as resource system, players are given resources when they take damage. One prevents players from playing their cards, the other one enables them to play their cards. You can guess which one is more fun to experience. I mean, just in general, giving cards additional uses and roles tends to be a good idea, such as games that use cards with multiple modes or options. If you really, really want to do a life decking system in your game, make sure it includes ways to allow players to use their cards, such as positive gain trigger effects or robust discard pile interaction that allows players to turn around a bad situation or even plan around taking high damage. Players want to play their cards and giving them more ways to play them, really play them, is usually met with excitement. So that's the story of life decking. It really isn't the efficiency booster a lot of game designers seem to think it is. If anything, it turns the cards in one player's deck into just a number. Boring and expendable as they get thrown into the garbage. Players want to play their cards, and any kind of game that uses cards out of a player's deck to calculate their life total needs to accommodate that. It needs to be just as exciting for the players who are receiving damage as the ones dealing it. Players want to play their cards, and a good damages resource system can help facilitate that. Keep that in mind, and you too can avoid falling victim to one of the seven deadly sins of card game design.